to at Ken on Thursday evening, Ken Dodd's Palace of Laughter. Among those appearing with Ken at the Lyceum Theatre crew are Peter Goodwright. 24 hours a day, entertainment, entertainment, radio too. This is the British Broadcasting Corporation. We present On the Air, a nostalgia quiz programme covering over 60 years of radio history. The programme is compiled and introduced by David Ryder. Hello. Now, memory can play funny tricks. Were yesterday's radio programmes as good as we thought, or is it a case of listening through rose-coloured ear trumpets? Well... In the next half hour, we may find out, as we give the kiss of life to a body of old broadcasts, and I have the invaluable assistance of four expert assessors who are back for a second helping of nostalgia. Now, our first guest used to be a BBC producer, but he's all right now. <laughs> he's the, uh, the king of the quizzes, the panjandrum of the panel games, from 20 questions to dealing with Daniels, Ian Messiter. A recent poll of readers of the New Musical Express revealed that their fifth favourite radio programme, alongside the efforts of the likes of John Peel and Steve Wright, was The Archers, which is good if slightly surprising news for Ambridge stalwart Norman Painting. <laughs> as something was stirring down in Streatham in the early 1950s, two men were perfecting their craft as scriptwriters, culminating in the outstanding success of Hancock's Half Hour. One of them was Ray Galton, and the other half was, and is, Alan Simpson. <laughs> Radio, our fourth guest once said, gets such a tiny slice of the licence money cake that it's absolutely criminal. Well, I'll drink to that, <laughs> or I would if my fee were bigger. <laughs> Instead, I'll share a glass of water with Roy Hudd. <laughs> Now, this first round is called Radio Ephemera. It says little bits and pieces of radio. Some of them are quite short, but they all mean something quite significant. Let's begin then with Ian. What is the significance of this sequence of drum beats? <laughs> it was the uh, Viva Victory sign. That's right. Uh, from the uh, last war. Two months. And uh, talking of the last war, I came out of the army and joined the BBC as a producer to meet the shock of my life. Was a, we had a programme called Starlight. I don't suppose anybody here remembers it. It used to be on Tuesdays and Thursday afternoons. It ran for exactly 15 minutes. It wasn't much. And it was live. And on one occasion, we were settling down, just somebody playing the piano, somebody mm -hmm. singing. I can't yeah. remember who it was. I think it was Elizabeth Welch. It could have been. And uh, it was live. The door flew open, and a man came in with a vacuum cleaner in his hand. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> like that, you know, I, I, that's not very good radio, but what I did was I made pushing motions with my hands to say, go away. And he didn't take any notice at all. He plugged the vacuum cleaner in, and he switched it on, where I leapt forward and pulled the plug out. And he looked at me as if to say, what on earth are you doing? And I said, excuse me, Will, this is a live broadcast. Which I... He said, well, there's too much bloody broadcasting going on here. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, perhaps we'd better stop in case he's still around. <laughs> 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 That's a lovely story. <laughs> oh, uh, and actually, um, going back to the B sign for a moment, the first reference I could find to it was, in fact, in July 1941, when a BBC, a handwritten BBC internal circulating memo, which sounds more like a medicine than, <laughs> than a letter, said uh, the, the V sign, of course, was the Morse code for V, dot, yes, dot, it dot, dash. It says the, the V sign on Tom Toms is to go out before every news bulletin in the European service beginning at midnight tonight. So it started in July 1941. Now then, Norman. Whose arrival was heralded by this theme? Oh, the... the goons. 
Ah, uh, yes, but which character? Which goon? What, uh, uh, no, was this character? Colonel Blubnock? Oh, yes. Indeed. Then he well, was. Actually, you promoted him. He was a major. Major Blubnock. Mm. <laughs> yes. Major Dennis Blubnock. That's right. Den- <laughs> major <laughs> Dennis Blubnock, yes. Now, Alan, yours came from a program that ran from the 1930s to the 1960s. <laughs> It's not a signature tune of a programme, but it's a signature tune of a bit within a programme. I hope that's perfectly clear. I don't yes, understand. Yes, indeed. Really. Yeah, I still don't know what it is. Um, <laughs> Would you like a clue? Yes, please, yes. Violets? Lovely oh. violets? Oh, we're yeah, in town tonight. Oh. Yes, yes. Got a point for the programme. After yes, in, ta- in town tonight. Uh, so therefore, what, there was a bit in the middle, yeah. Was it the celebrity spot? It was, Norman, yes, a bonus. That's right. Celeb- that, that piece of music was actually written by Robert Farnham and called A Star is Born. And as, ah, as Norman said, well, it heralded the, the, uh, the arrival of, the, of the, uh, <laughs> the guest celebrity at the end yeah, of each edition right. of In Town Tonight. Was that a programme you listened to, Alan, when you were a young man? Indeed, life? yes. I tell you what we used to do. We um, used to listen to a lot of uh, American uh, oh, comedy yeah. shows during the war because they used to be broadcast on the American Forces Network. Mm. Uh, used to broadcast, uh, we used to get Jack Benny and uh, Bob Hope, Bing Crosby, all the American shows used to listen to. Did, mm. did that influence your, your writing in any way? The people who influenced Ray and I more than anything, uh, in, I suppose, in the actual act of writing, were Frank Mew and Dennis Norton. I mean, mm. they, were the, they were the governors uh, when we started. I mean, they were absolutely... But they gave script writing a respectable name. I mean, they were... They're, they're... I think they were the first people who ever really got... The public ever knew who were script writers, really, weren't they? Yeah. I used to listen to... Um, I was evacuated during the war, you know, and there used to be lots of good comedy programmes, I remember, like Mad Dan, Much Bind in the Marsh, particularly, which was Dickie Murdoch and um, Kenneth Horne. And the other one was Navy Mix, Joe. I don't know if anyone remembers Navy yeah, Mix, Navy. Joe. Mm-hmm. And I always remember they used to have the most ludicrous thing on that, and it, they used to have a conjurer on. <laughs> <in it. laughs> Mind you, you talk about a, a, a conjurer on radio being odd. I mean, what about a ventriloquist? Yeah, that was I good, mean, wasn't yeah. it? Makes life easy for him. Yes, indeed. <laughs> well, and, and that was... Uh, of course, you had two, didn't you? And, uh, Charlie McCarthy and Edgar Berger and Charlie mm. McCarthy, and of course, over here, Peter Buff and Archie Andrews. Well, oh, there's a very cruel story about... Uh, uh, Peter Bruff, you know, who wasn't the greatest technician as a ventriloquist. I think he did make Archie a marvellous voice for radio. Mm. But when he was on the stage, you know, you could see his lips moving like there's no tomorrows, you know. <laughs> Just a blur his lips were in the act. You know? <laughs> 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 the nicest man in show business, I found one of the nicest men in show business was Sandy Powell, you know. And okay. Ted Ray told me they were all having a drink one uh, Sunday night at the Water Rats pub, you know, and... Uh, Peter Bruff was there, and so was Sandy. And Sandy said to Peter Bruff, he said, uh, where are you working next week then, uh, Peter? He said, oh, I'm at the Lyceum Sheffield next week. He said, you'll do very well there. The lighting's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> I mean, whenever, whenever Peter was on stage, he used to have this enormous great cigar, didn't he? Puffing away there. And, uh, and every time Archie spoke, he used to puff this great cloud of cigar yeah. <laughs> smoke so you couldn't see his lips moving. <laughs> Sandy loved ventriloquists, because I'm uh, sure you remember Sandy's great vet routine. Oh, he used really? to have a great big moustache, didn't he? <laughs> that covered his, all his face down there, so you couldn't see his lips moving. <laughs> Mum. <laughs> he used to love the bit right in the middle of the act, and he used to be doing this thing, and the edge used to fall off. <laughs> <laughs> Roll across the stage. He used to say, Oh dear, now I've given the game away. <laughs> <laughs> <He's had that. laughs> well, uh, according to my calculations, we still have a bit of radio ephemera. <laughs> <over here somewhere. laughs> and it belongs to Roy. Roy, this is something that's still heard many times each day on the World Service. It's called Lily Bolero, isn't yes. it? And it's one of the very oldest recorded tunes, British tunes, I believe. Yeah. And I, I always hear the World Service all the time when you're playing the clubs, you know, and you're coming back about two right. o'clock in the morning, you get good plays on the World Service and that. I think that's for the news, isn't it? That's right. Mm. Yes. Changing of the announcers. <laughs> 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 Changing like of the announcers. It's what's what officially uh, referred to as the news prelude yeah. in World Service parlance. That's right. Now, among my collection of radio memorabilia, 
are several copies of Radio Pictorial, the radio equivalent of Picture Guard, published in the 30s. Now, for the benefit of the audience here, and you at home looking down your loudspeakers, I'm holding up a copy of Radio Pictorial. Everyone's going, ah, yes. Now, what we're going to do here is uh, ask David Bennett to read some short pieces from this publication and see if you can guess who the pieces are being written about. So, Ian, this piece actually refers to someone connected with this programme. When he first broadcast in 1924, he was asked to announce, but would not do so because his stammer was so bad. Then he determined that he would not be beaten, and a year or two later he forced himself by sheer willpower to try announcing. The stammer that he had always regarded as a terrible disadvantage turned out to be his greatest asset, and it was this, and his delightful southern burr, that endeared him to the public. Oh, that was... Obviously he became... King. (laughs) (laughs) I I wish I'd thought of that I will later (laughs) Um, now the answer is Carol Gibbons Oh, on the uh, air. On the air. That's right, you see. Now, now isn't that interesting? Because air, Alan, when you play the signature show, and Alan and I, we, we deserve a point if one of us is right for this, you know, because yes. we were having a debate as to who was playing on that opening thing. Alan said Carol Gibbons, I said Frank Bruno, so who was right? <laughs> <laughs> Alan, right. Yeah. Alan gets a point. Give, give him oh, a yeah, point. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Young man who started yes, playing the piano. Say, go, 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 go. Good night, everybody. Right. He actually right. made capital of his stammer because people found it rather attractive. Anyway, here's another example of his relaxed. Style. I'm gonna get lit up when the lights go up in London. I'm gonna get lit up as I've never been before. You will find me on the tile. You will find me wreathed in smiles. I'm gonna get so lit up I'll be visible for miles. Now then, Norman. Can you uh, identify this piece which refers eventually to a fictional detective? He is, of course, the man who created that gruff, friendly and infallibly shrewd gentleman who is heard week after week in Monday Night at Seven. Warmy, as his hundreds of friends call him, has had a very distinguished career as an actor. He acted with the famous Lewis Waller and was a personal friend of that celebrated matinee idol. Wasn't it called Inspector Hornley Investigates? It certainly was. Two marks. And the actor was S.J. Warmington? It was indeed, yes. Isn't that extraordinary? I live in a village called Warmington. (laughs) 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 Yes, you're absolutely right. Actually, talking about Monday night at seven and Monday night at eight, I've got a a memo here written by uh, Harry Pepper, who produced Monday night at eight in 1943. The bishop? The bishop. Was he? Known as Bishop Pepper. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Why? Uh, Yes, he was known as Bishop Pepper. Yeah. Ah. That's interesting. Anyway, th- this memo... Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I've just remembered why. Oh, good. Uh, it, uh, comics christened him the bishop because of... He said, <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> He's still at the BBC in spirit, I guarantee it. <laughs> uh, this this uh, little BBC memo which he wrote to the presentation editor, it said, uh, I'm usually, usually able to finish the final signature tune within two or three seconds of the first chime of Big Ben, but twice during this series, the preceding programme has overrun, therefore I have begun late. Would you please inquire into this and make it a rule that I start punctually and am not interfered with until 20 seconds to (laughs) 9pm. Norman, uh, in passing, there's uh, mentioned he lived in Warmington and the actor's name was Warmington. It reminds me um, when Ray and I want to find some names for for actors, you know, nice Shakespearean actors' names. The best way of doing it is to get the map of Dorset out (laughs) and pick some of the villages. Oakford Fitzpatrick. Oh, yeah, well, I'm Studholm Barclay. Oh, oh, lovely. Can you mean Sir Studholm Barclay? Oh, it's lovely, isn't it? Melton Mowbray. That's not in Dorset. No, but, yeah. But, uh, oddly enough, um, Oscar Wilde did that, and so did Terence Rattigan, didn't they? Oh, they, I knew I got the idea they, for some reason. I mean, you're... <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you're, you're in tremendously good company. How dare they pinch my material? <laughs> <laughs> oh, know, right. la- la- Lady Bracknell, to name but a few. Well, oh. Let's remind ourselves of uh, Inspector Hornley Investigates, and here's a, a typical scene from the series. Listen, men, I'd like you to do something for me. Find out if and how Taylor benefits by the death of his wife. What the deuce do you mean? Call insurance, a legacy, or something like that. I don't believe his story. Do you believe that he tampered with the electric current? Well, he certainly did that, but I believe that he did it for the purpose of killing his wife. Can you prove it? If I have a motive for the murder, yes. Stirring stuff, isn't it? Yeah, that's oh, right. Yeah. Now, Alan, for you, this takes us back to the musical side of radio, though with a different emphasis. 
When he'd completed his education at Oxford, his father's wealth gave him the opportunity of beginning immediately on his chosen career. He was only 27 when he formed his own orchestra and gave many concerts of old music. In fact, when he appeared at the Queen's Hall, he filled every seat in the house. It's quite an achievement, all by himself. Max <laughs> Jaffer. No, not Max Jaffer. <laughs> no, not Max Jaffer. <laughs> That'd be Henry Wood, I would think. No, it's not Henry Wood. He wasn't at Oxford, was he? Oh, I mean, here we have a university buff. When he was 27. Mm. No, the thing about Henry Wood was that he was he was a brilliant lad from mm. about 14. He lived, Henry Wood. lived not far away from here and was a very much a, a cockney. And, and mm. I don't think, in fact, had a great deal of formal education. That's why he was a mm. genius. But well, it wasn't him anyway. No, I and mean, this man went to Oxford and his father was wealthy and at 27 he formed he, he his formed, own orchestra. Yeah. His own Tommy B. Group. It could, yes, Berners Point, Norman. That's mm. right. Yes. Oh. Thomas Beecham. And uh, here is Sir Thomas uh, with a brisk excerpt from one of his lollipops. Marvellous what those pills do for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, actually that, that leads me into a story that um, Freddie Griswold used to tell. Uh, and he was a very young announcer. He put on a record. Uh, and as he went to put the, the actual metal needle down on the 78 disc, his cuff altered the speed thing. <laughs> and it was a piece of Tannhäuser. And it played terribly fast, and he said he panicked, and he didn't know what to do. He said, what I should have done is merely to have taken the needle. I said, I'm terribly sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I will now try again. Instead of which, he left, he left it running, so they got most of the ring cycle in about 25 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people wrote in and complained, except one man who wrote in and he said he congratulated the British Broadcasting Corporation. He had never heard Wagner better play. <laughs> <laughs> Signed... Thomas Beach. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. In fact, that, that uh, article from Radio Victoria referred to some broadcasts made by Tommy Beecham with the London Philharmonic Orchestra on Radio Luxembourg, sponsored, of course, by the family firm. By oh, yeah. Roy, I'm glad to have found a place for a unique entertainer. His writing might well be that of Peter Pan or any other boy who wouldn't grow up. Everyone knows that he is one of the best, if not the best, child impersonator extant. He's an outsized child himself, and his appeal is the appeal of all children to all child lovers. Oh, it has to be Harry Hemsley. Yes, it is. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Harry Wonderful Hemsley. Act. He was terrific. And I, I think almost the last broadcast he did, he used to do... Um, they were sort of, I think they were around about lunchtime, and they, it used to be with an old sailor, these were. And all the kids used to visit, visit this old yeah. sailor, and he used to tell... Um, Tell stories. And I've got a feeling it was Fred Yule who did The oh, Old yeah. Sailor. Yeah. And I can't think... I, I know that the signature was, uh, I'm hearty, old hearty, I'm hearty, the longshore man. That's all I can remember. It's unfortunate, actually. Aren't you none... pleased? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. What a relief. It's sad, really, that uh, none of Hemsley's radio broadcasts have actually survived. There's only records. But uh, that does allow us to hear a typical Hemsley family scene. That reminds me, Winnie. Have you seen that dear little baby cousin the stock brought you around to last week? Oh, yes, yeah, she's a dear little thing, isn't she? Has Horace seen her? No, no, Horace hasn't. Would he like to? I'll ask him. Horace, would you like to see your dear little baby cousin that Miss Tork brought to Auntie last week? Oh, he can't, I got this, sorry. What did he say? <laughs> he said no, he'd rather see Miss Tork. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great catchphrase, what did Horace say? Yeah, yeah. What did Horace say, Winnie? Yeah. Brilliant, wasn't it? I always, think, I always think that Wills must have sounded like Horace, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no. I think we're going to enjoy this next round. I'm going to enjoy it. It's called Music Hall Greats. Now, it was radio's good fortune to have been able to capture some famous names of the music hall towards the end of their careers. So here are four legendary names. And, uh, gentlemen, uh, the rest of you, Professor Hudd will help you out, I think, if you've got any trouble here. <laughs> Ian, yes. who is impersonating a blushing bride here? Girls, what a day it's been. And what a wedding it was, to be sure. Well, that's why we had a wedding, to be sure. <laughs> You never know, he was late at the church, but not late enough. I wasn't sure of him till the bands went up three weeks ago. They do say there's always three clear Sundays before the execution takes place. And I don't know whether he's got any money or not, but I do know that he pays income tax. I suppose that's why he's taken me on, to get a bit off. 
It wasn't Danny LaRue. <laughs> <laughs> no, it certainly wasn't. It was George Roby, the greatest of them all, I think, yes. in, those, in those days, certainly. The Prime Minister of Merth. Yes. That's what he called himself, mm. yes. Norman, for you, a nice bit of singing. I'm going back again to old Nebraska And if anyone should ask you I'll be where the waving cornfields grow The bowl of porridge makes the most inviting meal I know. It's, it's an artist who had a billing which you couldn't possibly use today. No, indeed. Um, the chocolate-coloured one. That's mm. right. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, with person of a... The chocolate-coloured no, person, yes. Mm. Uh, I thought for a minute, uh, oddly enough, to be perfectly honest, uh, because you can hear a bit of breathing on there, and I thought it was Randolph <gasps> Sutton, but it, uh, yeah. in, in fact, I think, was... G.H. Eliot. Yes, it was. That recording of G.H. Eliot came from a 1948 broadcast of Thanks for the Memory, which was a radio version of Don Ross's stage production. And also on the bill were Randolph Sutton, Ella Shields, Talbot O'Farrell, Gertie Kitana, and Billy Danvers. And one other for you, Alan, another artist on the Thanks for Memory bill. I don't like my father. I trust eat it. No, no, no. I'd sooner die, but I tied it round my neck. Tomorrow I shall be down at the bottom of the deep blue <laughs> She was I, right, I, rightly referred to as the essence of ecstasy. Yeah, I, I mean, I know, I know who it is. It's, uh, it's Nellie Wallace, and yeah. uh, I, an artist I didn't see, and I've always wished I, I had. She wore this feathered board, didn't she? That's you know, right. she yeah. Most eccentric lady I wish I'd seen. I never saw her, you know. And uh, she'd left the Thanks for the Memory Company by the time I used to go to the Croydon Empire. But she did have some marvellous songs, you know. Um, there was a one <laughs> in one of her songs that used to have, uh, his His photograph I keep neath my pillow while I sleep. This morning I found that I had put my big toe through his eye. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they don't write them off. <laughs> uh, that coal port was a bit of a lyricist, wasn't it? <laughs> and do, do, do you remember the, the, um, the sort of love song she sang? I forget the, the song itself. I remember this, this bit of pattern, I think it was. We carved our names upon a tree. The poor tree died next day. <laughs> <laughs> and you remember the Western brothers? They had a... A, a bit of patter which they used to put to between their songs and one went something like yes you know he's got a picture it's in the Wallace collection the Nelly Wallace collection <laughs> <laughs> now then Roy it's your turn and I've gone for this artist to Garrison Theatre in 1940 and if you don't know this I'm going home <laughs> You don't know who you're looking at, now just you look at me. I'm a bit of a knob, I am belong to royalty. I'll tell you how we got about, I married Widow Birch. I was king of England when we trotted out the church. Outside the people started shouting in Murray. Said I go down upon your knees, it's coronation day. I'm in the radiate, I am. In the radiate, I am, I am. I got married to the widow next door. She'd been married to Seven times before, everyone was a hen of him. She wouldn't have a Billy or a Sam. I'm a right old man named Hen of Hen of I am. Beautiful. He was 75 when that show was recorded. Yeah. Yes, Bruce Trent. How could you? <laughs> 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 Don't mean it, Bruce. Obviously, Harry Champion. That's yeah. right. What a great voice, isn't that? Mm. And great songs, Alan was saying. Oh, my, he had some marvellous songs. A lot of them about food. Lots of them about food. Oh, Bald beef and cuts, yeah. yeah. Um, hot, hot meat pies, savoloys and trotters. He had one. <laughs> And he had one, I've only, I've, I found a copy of it last year. The song is not that marvellous, but it's a great title. Put a bit of treacle on me, Puddin' Mary Ann. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> yeah, well, well I, I don't think we ought to take that one any further, Roy. <laughs> David, the, the first time I ever heard that song sung on the stage was a yeah. pantomime in Coventry, and Jimmy Wheeler was it. <laughs> and it, this, he was doing the song sheet with the kids, believe it or not. And that was the song sheet. <laughs> he said, now I'm going to do this song for you now. He said, put a bit of treacle on me pudding, Mary Ann. <laughs> he said, now I want all the little boys to hold out their puddings. <laughs> And all the little girls who put treacle on them. <laughs> <laughs> it was in one night, I think, that song, and it was out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Uh, now then, oh, if I can get, uh, if I can uh, assume a straight face, <laughs> no chance. Now, while I, I juggle the score sheet, uh, here's another champion moment from Radio's Clots Corner. And this, well, it's a wonderful example of an inappropriate choice of word. And now we have a very attractive young lady here at our microphones. What's your name? Mrs. Renee Robertson. And what are you doing in town? I'm on my honeymoon. Your honeymoon. Well, are you enjoying it? Oh, I'm enjoying every inch of it. sort of stuff you like. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm making absolutely no comment. I want to be, be here next week. Now then, uh, let's have a look at the score sheet. And it's a victory this week for Norman Painting. Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy the prize. It's a wonderful music hall meal, Norman. You've got some of Harry Champion's boiled beef and carrots, topped with a slab of Nellie Wallace's mum's pie crust, a little of G.H. Eliot's porridge to follow, and the whole thing rounded off with a wedge of George Roby's wedding cake. Oh, splendid. <laughs> and as a, as a kid, you know, I must have been simply dreadful at concerts and things, and with a red nose, I used to sing a song, and Royal know whose it was, which was called A Neg and Some Nam and a Honey and. Ernie Mayne. Uh, no. Ernie Mayne, yeah. There you are. Now you know. So now I have the complete meal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, one, uh, of, one of Tommy Beecham's pills or what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what am I? And a bit of treacle on his pudding and he's treacle. <laughs> <laughs> and a great big smile right over his face. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, gentlemen, for your erudition. I just hope it isn't catching. And uh, <laughs> I'll be dishing up a final menu of radio tidbits next week. And this is where Only Air goes off the air. Goodbye. <laughs> That was On the Air, a radio nostalgia quiz devised and chaired by David Ryder. Taking part were Ian Messiter, Norman Painting, Alan Simpson and Roy Hard. The announcer was me, David Bellin, and the programme, which was recorded, was produced by Richard Edis. <laughs> And strolling down memory lane next week will be Barry Cryer, John Dunn, Bob Holness and Gloria Honeyford. Tomorrow, between 10.30 and 11, more nostalgia with Teddy Johnson, uh, Teddy Johnson and the music goes round and round at 78 RPM. Now, we mentioned Gloria Honeyford. Her expert guest on her programme starting at five past two tomorrow will be financial expert Tony Curtis. If you want to talk to him about any money problems, telephone 01 580 4444. 01 5804444 between two and a quarter to three. Gloria will also be talking to Sandy Wilson, who wrote several hit musicals, including The Boyfriend and Salad Days. We also mentioned John Dunn on his show, starting at five past seven or five past five uh, until seven. He'll be talking to Donny Osmond, one of the vast family of singers, probably the most famous. And Don is making a comeback. He's released a new single. After the news, Peter Clayton presents Round Midnight. Radio two. It's 11 o'clock. At the news desk, Paul Layton. The new leader of the Social Democratic Party, Mr Robert McKennan, has called on members to end the feuding within the party. Speaking at the SDP conference in Portsmouth, he urged them to give the merger talks with the Liberals a chance. He said when it came to negotiations, there should be no...